Tom, your predecessor, Roger Guffey, started this uh, many, many years ago as an agricultural conference. It evolved into an economic symposium, but mm -hmm. did you ever think, you were working at the bank then, did I you was. ever think it would get to be this kind of event? I don't think anyone expected it to be you know, this kind of event, but I think they always uh, had intended that it would be a, a, an important event, one that discussed issues that were um, significant to our region originally. Now, that's why agriculture was chosen and then water was chosen. But as uh, time flowed and the topics became more important, especially with the um, period in 1979 to 1982, uh, we began to think more nationally in terms of the policy issues and that's when it became increasingly significant and um, I think because we give such, I hope, uh, give such a great deal of thought to the topic and to the timeliness of the topic that it's allowed it to prosper in that sense and, and we've had people uh, that have come here and built consensus. Uh, it's an area, it's a, it's a forum where you don't have um, you don't have standoffs. It's, it's designed to give people different opportunities to speak on different views and try and build towards a consensus. You, almost you've from you've the certainly beginning. had some meetings where people went at each other. Sure. Uh, the, the first one here in Jackson, <clears throat> Paul Volcker was right. there and he got an earful. Right, he did. It, but, but it wasn't, it was, I think, uh, in, in one sense constructive because it, it said to the world the Federal Reserve is open to criticism. We're not afraid of it. Uh, Paul Volcker was here, uh, didn't have a problem with uh, dealing with it. Uh, and so there are two points of view. There, there are differences. Let's have them here, and we're not afraid of it as the Federal Reserve. And I think that is a good thing. Uh, Interestingly, though, the Fed has always had, uh, until very recently, a reputation for secrecy. But since the beginning, you've allowed reporters in. Yes. Well, part of our goal was to have a discussion that involved um, academics, um, people from the market, central bankers to some degree, and to have this dialogue and have it in the open so there's no behind closed doors kind of uh, image that came from it, so that there would be more credibility, more substance in terms of people's understanding. And we took a chance, it was a risk, but uh, one that we're proud we took and one that has paid off I think well. Well do you think that affects the dialogue and what happens inside um in recent years, you've got this gigantic setup, which we're part of here, right. of television networks, radio networks, uh, worldwide publicity. The feds never wanted to have its meetings televised right. because right. they're afraid it would affect things. Uh, does it affect the, all this coverage, affect what happens inside? I, it's hard to know. Uh, I don't think so because the dialogue continues to be very vibrant. Uh, if, if people look back a couple of years when the housing crisis broke and we were involved in that. People were very candid, uh, some people very critical. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to think not. Uh, it's been still very open, productive. You know, maybe over time that could change, but right now I feel pretty comfortable with it. You have basically the whole world, at least anybody with an interest in money, watching what's going to happen here on Friday because Ben Bernanke is going to give a speech. It's become an annual event right. the last couple right. of years of, of him giving this major speech. Is that unfortunate? Does that detract from what you're trying to do? Well, I think, um, I think the media has to make of it what they will. Um, I think, though, once you get past that and we get into the conference, I think the dialogue opens up. People are very uh, candid with one another. Uh, our topic this year is on the long run. I feel very confident that we will uh, focus on that topic. We need to focus on that topic. It's time to think down the road. Uh, in terms of policy, so here's a real opportunity, and I think it will turn to that, so I'm not too worried about it at all. As a Fed policymaker, given that you're, uh, the old saying about being uh, up to your neck in alligators, uh, can you worry about more than draining the swamp right now, though? Can you uh, really focus farther out on what policy should be until you see how the economy develops? Well, if you don't focus more longer term, if you don't get out there ways, you won't ever solve this problem. Problems are, Crises are dealt with in the moment. Problems are dealt with in the long run. We have a problem. It's time to look to the long run. We have a problem in this country of debt. The world has a problem with, it, with debt. It isn't an overnight solution. It takes time. It takes long run thinking. Uh, it takes coming back to Simpson Bowles and how are we gonna get out of this. If we don't turn to the long run, 
we will be dealing with overnight crisis for as far as the eye can see. It's time to think more broadly, deeply, and longer term. Obviously, that's on the fiscal side. What would you say the long-term monetary policy issue is? I don't, I don't think monetary policy's long-term goals have changed. Price stability, we need to be able to, to provide an environment where people can make decisions, where price signals mean something. And that's our, that should be our mission. Now, we've had this financial crisis. We had to provide liquidity into the market. But now we need to turn ourselves to, uh, we can't do it all. Monetary policy is a tool, but it's a tool that can't solve every problem in America or in the globe today. And the sooner we turn our attention from the immediate to the longer term, the more, I think, adequate will be the solution that we finally come up with. There's a lot of talk about changing the Fed's mandate, changing the way the Fed does business, uh, leaving the politics aside. Is there something that you would see with your long experience that would help the Fed longer term, uh, uh, some sort of change in either the mandate or the, the method of, uh, of making policy that would be good for policy in the long run? Well, I think the mandate's quite fine. I think the mandate, if you read it carefully, is the long run. The long run is used in that mandate three times and we need to follow the mandate. Long-term growth consistent with potential growth. Long-term stable interest rates. Long-term uh, 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 employment, stable employment. That's the goal, and the mandate's fine. We just have to turn our attention to that long-run goal. Would it be helpful to <clears throat> write something in a price target uh, into law, or is that something that, um, I, you know, I know that the FOMC is considering it, that various uh, FOMCs should be able to decide on themselves? Well, I think the law says long-term stable prices. What more do you need? That's the goal. And I think to get yourself tied up in political um, issues of whether it means this or it means that is, is, is a waste of energy, when in fact we have a mandate. And in fact, we need to be looking to the long run. And monetary policy has to follow its mission and demand that fiscal and market economy uh, is able to function according to its uh, discipline and its mission. So that's where I am focused on, the long-term monetary policy is about the long-term. If we get our country focusing on that, take commissions like Simpson Bowles seriously, then we will have solutions that I think will allow our economy to remain the strongest, most vibrant economy in the world. A lot of people, uh, especially recently, have suggested that the price stability part, obviously you focus on that and, it, and it's been successful, but that uh, the Fed, or at least economists have learned over the years that monetary policy really can't affect unemployment the same way. Do you agree? I think, I think there's nothing inconsistent with stable prices and full employment. I think that stable prices is a necessary condition for that. Uh, and when you get away from that, you, in, you introduce instability into the market. And then full employment follows a stable monetary policy, a stable fiscal policy, a good markets economy. Uh, that's an outcome. It's not an input. But you've got 2% inflation right now, roughly, and you've got 9% unemployment. Can you target unemployment with monetary policy? No, I don't think you can, and I don't think you should. Uh, we should be concerned about stable prices. I think now we need to turn to those things in the economy that are affecting uncertainty. Uh, wh what about, what are we going to do with the, 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 the new regulations? How are they going to get implemented? Um, what is the environment for business going forward? One of the things in this country that we've done for two decades now, we've consistently consumed more than we've produced. That's not sustainable. We have a savings rate that was allowed to go to zero. That's not sustainable. So what are the policy choices we're going to make to, over time, allow our economy to become rebalanced, to produce more, to, to, re to better balance ourselves with the rest of the world. When we focus on those things, then em em employment will begin, I think, to increase once again systematically and towards a fuller employment or full employment. You mentioned uncertainty. Uh, obviously, the slowdown in the economy has taken everybody by surprise. The uh, Fed didn't forecast it. Uh, how much is it due to uncertainty over the whole fiscal issue that we saw recently or what's going on in Europe and how much do you think it might be a fundamental problem that uh, maybe we haven't come out of the last recession or we just haven't built enough confidence to keep going? Well, I think the first thing to remember that uh, the, uh, the economy for some time people have, 
people like myself have said, we're going to have moderate growth uh, over time. And that would be good because the fact of the matter is we do have a lot of debt in this country. We need to work it off. It, that will take time. Uh, and in that environment, we will have a slower growth uh, outlook. But around that then, every time it does uh, begin to slow, people tend to almost panic. Uh, well, is this, is this another recession, is this a double dip? Rather than, well, we knew it was going to be modest. What are the things we're doing in the other sectors of the economy? What are we doing with fiscal policy? And I think not having a solution to fiscal policy and having an environment where businesses are unsure of what the future will hold uh, has, has its own constraining effects on the economy, and that we need to address. Is the that, sooner is, we do it, the better. Is that what the businesses in your district are telling you, that one of their biggest problems is they don't know what their environment is going to be? Well, most of the businesses in our part of the world are fairly optimistic. Uh, we have energy, we have agriculture, they're, they're very positive. But they're also saying, well, we, we really do want to see how finally all the new rules are written and how they affect us, uh, how the health care will come and how it will affect us. We want to, you know, they're not saying it has to be repealed necessarily. They're just saying we want to understand what it is. Once we know that, then we can make some decisions and move forward. So they're, they're ready to move, but they want to make sure we get through this transition, get through these rules. Uh, and they are concerned about future inflation. Uh, in our region, for example, they are seeing the value of land go from $6,000 an acre to $12,000, uh, reintroducing uh, the idea of leverage uh, in that sector. So they're, they're uneasy with that. So yeah, there's uncertainty. We need to get past that. But it's not simple and it's not a quick fix. Well, it's interesting you mentioned uh, your district and people being optimistic. I know you don't want to speak for your colleagues who dissented at the last uh, meeting, but you dissented all of last year. And some have said that's because uh, those three and yourself are in districts that are doing better than the rest of the country. Uh, well, I can't speak for the other three. I'll speak for myself. My view was that you cannot uh, really have a... Uh, here's a question I ask. Do you know of any product, any service, uh, that trades well at zero, price of zero. Do, do you think credit then can trade well, give the signals to the economy that need to be given at zero? What are you incenting at, at zero? What kind of new imbalances are you hoping to create? And my point was that the markets uh, have to think about it, have to think for themselves. And if you say it's extended period that you have this so so-called safe harbor of extended period where you can engage in risk, uh, engage in other speculative activities. What are you trading away for the future? What are you, uh, w what kinds of resource misallocations are you incenting around that? So don't do it. Let the markets read the signals, take calculated risk, know what the rules of the game are, and we'll get a better outcome at the other end. Sounds like you would have voted no last time as well. Well, I, all I have is my record, and people have to judge me on my record, so it probably wouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Well, would you then uh, say it wouldn't be a surprise uh, if I suggested you probably would oppose additional action at this point? It, it probably would be uh, not a surprise to very many people, at least. <laughs> is, there, is there anything the Fed, well, it's a two-part question. Is there anything the Fed can do? Uh, at this point, or is there anything the Fed should do? Uh, do people expect too much of the central bank? I, th I think the answer to the second part is yes. They do expect uh, monetary policy to, to solve. I, I'm surprised they haven't offered it up to actually uh, take care of the common cold. I mean, it's just uh, expected to do everything when there's so many other things that play an extremely important role as well. And so we need to understand monetary policy is an important tool. It is a valuable tool, but it is not an exclusive tool, and it does not solve all problems uh, at all, and it does not solve some problems well. It can actually do harm, and we need to be mindful of that as we conduct monetary policy in this country and around the world. On the first part, is there anything that you could do that you think would work? I think what you do is say, this is what we've done to the world. Uh, now we want to have our Congress address the fiscal issues long term. We want our uh, country to begin to look at the long term. I'd like to see the Simpson-Bowles Commission report taken up again because it had a long term plan that identified where the debt to GDP ratio would be coming down. I think that would bring more confidence 
to the American people than just about anything else. That yes, we are on top of this. Yes, we're not gonna choke it off immediately. Here's a long-term plan. If we follow that plan, then we will see the light at the end of the tunnel and all be better off for it. But you're sort of constrained. Ben Bernanke can't come out and say, I'm not gonna do anything. You gotta do something, Congress, right? Uh, you try to stay out of politics? Uh, uh, all I can say is, I don't think you have to get into politics to, to define what your role is because the, the, the law defines what your role is, your tools define what your role is. I think, I think that's what you follow. And if you try and do more than that, uh, you, you raise expectations beyond what you're capable of delivering. From history, uh, obviously Ben Bernanke studied that in 1937, the Fed made mistakes. He told Milton Friedman <laughs> that they wouldn't make them again. When you look at 9% unemployment and you say, it's not our job to fix everything. Don't you feel those some sort of uh, feeling that you know we got to try something to help? Well, let me tell let me tell you two things. Number one, 1937, uh, I agree, uh, but what we did is double the reserve requirements. What a shock to the economy! No, I wouldn't do that again. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is take away the extended period language, which is a very modest thing, saying be responsible. Uh, the, the second thing is uh, here. Here's here's an example I use. In 2003, in the summer of June, uh, the unemployment rate was 6.5% and the interest rate was 1.25%. Everyone wanted the Fed to do more. We have to do more. And so they, we, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't voting, but we lowered the rate to 1% and left it there. And we had a credit boom. We had one, and you know what we ended up with? Unemployment of 10%. That's what I don't want to have happen again. You think people are too short-sighted in in looking to the Fed right now? I think people are, people naturally tend to be what's immediately uh, urgent. And what we, that, what this conference is about is what's long-term urgent, mm -hmm. because that's what we have to be aiming. We have to go to the long run. We have to do the things that will take us, show us a path out for the long run. Not easy, not simple. Right. I'm not, but I, but I say there is a, there is a starting point. That's why I keep bringing up Simpson Bowles. Uh, is there a Bernanke put out there, do you think? You have to ask Ben that. I, I don't know. I mean, do you think the markets uh, are too accustomed to the Fed acting? You have to ask the market that. All I know is if I were, if, you know, this is the policy that I recommended over the last year and a half, and that was not to give them um, uh, extended period language, let them make choices, make decisions. Uh, allocate credit based upon a, a risk analysis, that's what I prefer. Let me ask you one, one question about a specific policy because everybody's talking about it and that's the idea of an operation twist, uh, you know, to sell the short end, buy the long end. Mm -hmm. Didn't work very well in 1961. Uh, do you think it would work now? Yeah, well, I'd have to have some reason to think that it would and I don't see any reason why it would. What you're doing is increasing the duration on the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, but what's the fundamental problem? Is the fundamental problem uh, a yield curve issue? Or is the fundamental problem that the United States and the world has too much debt? And that we need to increase our production relative to our consumption in this nation. Would Operation Twist help solve the problem? If the answer is yes, go for it. If the answer is no, let's not, let's not play with that. That's, that's technical adjustments when we need fundamental adjustments, looking to the long run. What was your favorite conference over the years? Was there a topic or, or a meeting that uh, was more interesting or more fun than any of the others? I, I've been very, I think, very pleased with almost all of the topics. I think uh, one of my, in one sense, most rewarding was our uh, conference on price stability because we really did see a consensus build around the importance of having either a stable inflation target or price stability as a goal. Uh, I think that was a very important consensus to finally have everyone come to agree on. A second one that I've kind of thought about and, and enjoyed in looking back, and that is when in the, in the fall of, I think, two, 2006, when we decided to do the housing conference here. And people said, oh, that's kind of a boring topic. It's, that's moving forward. And when it came August, it was the topic of the, of the year. So we felt uh, somewhat um, I don't know, our thoughts were validated or whatever, but it, to, to be able to 
to anticipate the topic and be right is always a, a good feeling. You've had to scramble sometimes. You had to dollar one once for the dollar reverse course. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. You, you, it's better when it works out the way you think it's going to work out, doesn't it, <laughs> in all things. <laughs> Let me ask you one last question. Uh, your last meeting after all these years, uh, what's your, your, your greatest memory of, of being a, a member of the Fed and of the Open Market Committee, of all the crises that you've been through over the last 20 years? I, I think more than that, it's not one event, it's the, the, the importance, I think, of bringing the regional perspective in a very real sense from local boards of directors, from business leaders in the, in the region, in the local region, to the national policy debate. Um, it's, it's a very satisfying experience to listen to them, to hear their concerns, to mix that with your own knowledge and then bring that to a national debate uh, has been, uh, for me, the most rewarding part of my job. Now, that was the original reason the Fed was set up at, like it was. That's still valid today, then? It, it's, it's more valid today than ever. Um, we are still uh, a nation with different regional focuses, as, as we see today in the Midwest versus um, uh, the Northeast and so forth. And I think it also gives the American people, uh, as those who, who have the opportunity to think about it and learn, uh, a sense that, yes, there is local input into this. And we do carry a, mission, uh, a, message, a message back. We do talk to them and kind of explain things. And I think having that, that ability to go out and uh, tell the story region by region across this country has served the country uh, very well. Tom Hanek, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Good to be with you.